Good morning and welcome back ladies, gents and Pikachus to another analysis and breakdown of the Quran of the Muslims! Yes, we're on the final page of Surah 1, which we're going to break down into logical factual statements via my notation here. And the reason we will be doing this is so we can understand who or what is Allah, what does he mean by this book, and more importantly for us non-believers, how does this affect us in the world today? So before I get started, as I always do, I'm going to tell you now if you have any doubts as to the things I'm about to tell you or have previously said or my factual accuracy, please first buy and read one of these. And after having done so, you will recognise that every single word I'm going to say to you now is 100% true and accurate of the words of Allah and what Muslims believe in the world today. So if you've been keeping up with the series, which I hope you have been, You'll remember that the last episode we went through the conditions of um, different bargains, how money should be changing hands in the Muslim faith so that it all ends up back with Allah. And the last thing we went through is what happens, what punishments Allah will inflict upon you, O oh Muslims, if you try and hide your money away from Allah so that the mosque don't know you have it, if you give it to your wife or your slave, and you say, I don't have any money, I've, I've lent it out to other people. Ah, ah, ah. I will know, says Allah in the book, and you will be heavily punished. So, let's pick up where we left off last time, starting with 207. O oh, ye believers, write down your deals with a scribe. Don't let them scrimp on the details. With the liable person dictating what liability there is. If he be of lesser faith, wit or voice, then appoint an imam as guardian. Now, before we get to the end of this verse, I feel like... This is like lawyer speak, this is Allah lawyer speak because, and this is the final page of Surah 1, so remember, this is the least important thing in the whole first book. This is like a, an afterthought we're going to chuck in at the end to pretty it up and make it sound less genocide -y. so I feel like that's what's going on here. But if we break it down, O ye believers, so he's saying Muslims, other people aren't doing this because they're horrible dirty sinners and we're going to kill them later, but you, O Muslims, you have to deal like this. Write down your deals with a scribe, so, i.e. someone who can read and write, that's going to be the imam. So what he's saying here is, the imams have to be the arbitrators of your deals. They're the judges. So don't listen to the actual judges or the law of your countries, O Muslims, no. Write down your deals with an imam, who is a scribe, and don't let them scrimp on the details. Make sure every single thing is written into this massively long contract, which obviously you won't be bothered to read later, the Imams will be arbitrating on. So I feel like Allah is giving a, a large amount of power to the Imams over your deals, O Muslims. He carries on. Don't scrimp on the details with the liable person dictating what those liabilities will be. Lawyer speak once again from Allah. So what he means there is the liable person, whoever will be paying the money for this deal, say you're lending someone money, you're the liable person, even though they should be liable because they're paying it back to you, the way that Sharia works is when you lend someone money, it's on your head. You have to pay it. If they don't come up with the money, you have to give them more time and not put pressure on them and you have to eat the cost. And the reason is, as we know from the last episode, Allah says, don't be making any profit now, O Muslims. Only Allah is allowed to make profit. So if someone owes you money, there's no charge for them being late. There's no penalty for them being late. Even if they keep it and they never give back any money to you, as long as they're giving money to Allah in the mosque, no harm, no foul. That's what this means. Then he rounds out by saying, if that person who is liable be of lesser faith, wit or voice, so if this person is not a good Muslim, living in a good Muslim country, then appoint an imam as the guardian. So he's making sure, Allah is literally making sure by the penned letter of the law here in Sharia, that only imams get to arbitrate your deals. No one else. And as we know from our earlier readings, the Imams aren't always the most trustworthy of arbiters, you know, arbitration agents, and they will be oft forgiven by Allah. Should they be caught doing anything, you can't argue with them, neither can you even accuse them of anything, or chop chop, off with your head you're dead, and you'll be living forever in sin, so says Allah in his book. The verse goes on. See two men stand to witness who will stand to speak for witness if error is found or alleged. Do not shorten your writing nor the period of the agreement, though prefer a bargain to be fulfilled on the spot rather than a lengthy contract. <laughs> so we'll stop the verse there. It's a long verse this one, very long and boring. It's good that it's put in at 
That's why he's put it in at the end. This is the boring detail which no one really cares about and only the lawyers and the imams should be uh, interested in. So if we break that down, you're making a bargain with your friend. You're lending them $100 or you know 100 shekels, let's say. You're lending your friend 100 shekels. The imam has to be there to make sure your deal is written down properly and that there's witnesses and it's all done properly and that you won't pressure them or charge them interest or anything. It's absolutely vitally important that you don't make any money from this deal. That's why they're doing this. This whole contract thing in front of Allah and the imam, it's not to make sure you stick to your contract. It's not to make sure that no foul is done to you or the person you're lending money to. It is literally to make sure if money is changing hands, nothing goes in anyone's hand apart from in Allah's. So there's no interest, there's no nothing. And if they miss a payment, Allah needs to get paid first. So it's okay if they don't pay you, O oh Muslim, as long as they can fucking give the mosque money. That's why they're saying this. And then he says, see two, man, two men stand witness who will stand to witness if error is found. So even though the Imam is the witness to this whole bargain, you need to find two other guys. So you need three witnesses for one deal, despite the fact that even if the deal's broken, there's no penalty. You see what's going on here? Allah is making sure you don't do anything without the Imam and the mosque watching. And just to make sure your Imam is a trustworthy one, you need two witnesses that the Imam agrees with. So you need three guys from the mosque to, to ratify your deal with someone else, despite the fact that there's no penalty for them if they break it, or for you, and just to make sure the witnesses are there to make sure if any error is found or alleged, you didn't actually miss anything out of the text, and you didn't shorten the period of the agreement, like you didn't say, look, I need that money now, you know, can you just pay it to me now? None of that happens. But why is this happening if the deal has no penalty attached to it? It's because... The last line says, though preferably a bargain will be fulfilled on the spot rather than a lengthy contract. So we get to the fucking point of this long, boring, wordy load of crap, this word salad of lawyerness that Allah is inflicting upon his Muslims. Ugh, the point of this, as we know through this last line, though he prefer a bargain to be fulfilled on the spot, Allah is saying, even though I'm giving you all these boring details of contracts, Allah prefers it if you don't make any contracts. Do your dealings on the spot. And what that means is don't lend people money. Don't borrow money. If you need anything, go to the mosque. That's what this is saying. He's saying if you make deals, the mosque have to be there to ratify it. And you can't have a penalty. So if someone runs away with your money and never pays you back again, you can't punish them or be angry with them. So long as they're worshipping Allah and they're giving money to the mosque, then it's okay, no harm, no foul. But you have to eat the cost as well as pay Allah. So this is literally saying, don't make any deals, O Muslims. Don't take any loans, O Muslims, unless you're taking them from Allah. That's what this means. And then we uh, last, finally, we reach the last part of this long, boring word salad of a verse. If you carry out judgment on the spot where no contract is written, where no harm comes to either witness or scribe for favour, for Allah sees what you will do in this. End of verse, finally. So if we break this down, even though we've gone through the whole word salad of this is what you do, this is what you don't do, trying to put pressure on people so they don't have bargains outside of the mosque, that's what this is for, to make sure the mosque remain in control of you and your money so it goes back to Allah, if you carry out judgments on the spot where no contract is written, so if you literally lend someone money for like 10 minutes and you watch them spend it and then they come back to you and pay it back to you immediately, even if that happens, where no contract is written, where no harm comes to either the witnesses or the scribe, so even when there's no contract written, the scribe still has to be there and the two witnesses, otherwise Allah is not happy with you. If all that happens... Allah sees what you will do in this. So Allah is literally saying, don't make deals, don't lend money or borrow money. Even if you do it short term in the market for like half an hour, you have to do it in front of the scribe and the two witnesses. And even if you do that, Allah is going to be watching you. <laughs> so what I'm taking from this, dear ladies, gents and Pikachus, is that Allah is very, very worried. He's kind of insecure here. Allah is very worried that somewhere along the line, some of his money is going to get lost in the pockets of his Muslims. 
That's what I'm reading here. So Allah is literally saying, and it is a long, boring way of saying it, considering he's already said it in the last episode, Allah is saying, listen to me, O Muslim, don't you fucking dare take any of my money and give it to anyone else. Don't lend it to anyone else. Don't spend it elsewhere. Don't take it off anyone else because it's my money you'll be fucking taking. Give me your money. That is what Allah is saying. Give me your fucking money, O Muslims, or I will punish you severely. And if you don't give anyone money, you don't make any deals, you don't do anything wrong, and I receive all the money, you can go on your way, O Muslims. That's what this means. Oh, I'm glad we got through that. So, hopefully it's going to be a little bit more interesting now. 208. However be you travelled, nor unable to find a scribe, then it is sufficient to promise your fulfilment of payment of debt, and you shall not corrupt nor hide evidence, for your heart be tainted with guilt, so let him fear his Lord Allah who knows all things. End of verse. More word salads then, Allah. Okay. So, um, breaking it down, how I'm reading it into this is however. So we're still talking about the last bit of word salad, which I thought we were past Allah. But no, he wants to drag us back, kicking and screaming, into Allah's lawyer speak. So, however... Be you travelled, nor unable to find a scribe. So what Allah is saying here is even if you're outside of Islamic territory, you're travelling. Let's say you go to Britain, which is not an Islamic country, and you're there. Sharia still applies to you, O Muslim, despite the fact that they have their own laws, and you're now in their country. You don't take any notes of their laws. You fucking do this. Allah says in his book, you better do it. And what he's saying is, however travelled you be, even if you can't find any scribes to watch your bargains because Allah doesn't trust you, O Muslims, that's what this means. Between the lines, Allah is saying, I'm watching you. I have to have my scribes and my people there when you are dealing with my money, Allah says in the book, because I don't trust you and I know you're going to try and keep it rather than live in poverty like I fucking told you you should be doing. So if you're travelled and unable to find a scribe, then it is sufficient to promise to fulfil your payment of debt. See what he's doing here? So even if you can't do all that bargaining stuff, if you can't find a scribe, you have to just promise Allah in your heart that you will do what he says. Because there's no way he's going to be able to stop you at that point. So he's making sure, even if he's not there, none of his scribes are there, none of his witnesses are there, it's only you on your own. If you think you can get away with anything outside of what Allah can see, you fucking cannot. He's saying to you, if you're in that scenario, O oh Muslim, in order that you're worshipping him enough, so that he doesn't punish you, you have to promise that to Allah anyway. Despite the fact that you're in another country, he's not there and he can't see it. Otherwise, he'll punish you severely. So says Allah in the book. And he rounds out the verse by saying, And you shall not corrupt nor hide evidence, for your heart shall be tainted with guilt. So let him fear his Lord Allah, who knows all things. And I think it's fairly clear why he's saying this. He's saying, and you shall not corrupt nor hide the evidence, because without him being there with his scribe, without the mosque overseeing your deal, if there's any evidence that this deal happened, they will be able to punish you later and you'll owe that money back to Allah. So don't get rid of the evidence so that you can get away with keeping your own money, O Muslim, because Allah's watching you. I will know. Allah knows all things, says Allah in the book. So he's making sure you know even though you could be getting away with stuff, you know, doing it behind his head and not in front of his face like we saw before. Oh, Muslims, you could be getting away with fucking everything. You could be making deals, taking loans, gambling, drinking, doing whatever you like. You could even be friends with a Christian. Oh, God forbid. Allah forbid. You could even be friends with a Christian and have the Christian lend you money so you can set up shop in this country and disavow Islam and not live in poverty anymore. But just know... Allah's watching you and will know that you've done it. So don't even think about hiding any evidence from us. Because even without the evidence, Allah will know. That's what this means. And I suppose the, the, the kind of between the lines implication is actually if you did hide the evidence and destroy the evidence and there was no witnesses, how would the mosque ever find out? Allah's not going to know. The mosque aren't going to find out. So nobody will ever punish you, O Muslim. So actually... Allah's kind of nay on the ex nay telling you, if you do this, so long as you don't leave any evidence and the mosque don't find out, I'm just saying. <laughs> so we carry on to the last verse, 209. Allah knows all things. 
see what I mean? This guy's got no faith in himself. He has to literally force you to have all these witnesses, scribes, contracts, the lot. And if you're not there, if you're traveling and there's no scribes, you have to promise to Allah in front of him that you're going to do this properly. So even though he's just spent the whole page telling you, I'll oh, know, I'm watching you, I know what you're doing, Allah knows all things he sees and hears, all things, I'm watching you. Even though he's saying all that, the first line of the last verse of Shura 1 Allah knows all things, so call Allah to account of any barter or discussion of error. He's literally saying, if this happens, you must call Allah to watch you, because he won't know you're doing it otherwise. <laughs> so even though he's all-knowing, he's everywhere, he can read your minds and he can see the future, even though all that's true and he's mind-controlling you, you have to tell him and you have to make evidence. If you hide the evidence and you don't tell him, I'm watching you, says Allah in the book, and I will punish you. This guy's got no fucking clue, has he? He's giving himself away. Nobody who was confident that they could read minds and see the future would be cracking the whip for evidence on paper and saying, I need humans to watch this. That's like Jesus saying, I'm going to raise myself from the dead, but I need a team of scientists and doctors. If you need the scientists and doctors, you're not Jesus. You didn't raise yourself from the dead. It was the fucking doctors that did it. And that's this. Allah is not enforcing these deals. The scribe, the witnesses, the imam and the mosque are enforcing these deals because Allah can't be bothered to turn up and do his own dirty work, as we know. That's what this means. I'll carry on. The prophet did believe. The prophet did believe this all himself, as well as his prophecy and the Quran. All his messengers did say, we hear and we obey our Lord and thee is the end of all journeys. Allah knows all things. Blot out our sins, grant us your mercy, we shall fear only you. So enable us to destroy all those who refuse the worship of Allah. Allah, the overlord of all places and things. End of verse, end of reading. So, that was an interesting end to a rather lengthy lawyery bit about money, wasn't it, O oh Allah? Allah knows everything, so call Allah to account of any barter or discussion. So we've already been through that. That's Allah just having real bad insecurity about you not giving all his money back to him. You know, oh Muslims who aren't allowed to have riches and should live in poverty. Even if you run far away from your Islamic countries and you come here where there's money to be earned, which is, by the way, why all the richest Islamic people live here and in America and in Islamic countries there's bloody no money and they're all poor. That's why they do it. But even so... Allah will know if you don't give him his money and he will fucking punish you. That's why he's saying this. And then he goes on to say, the prophet did believe. So Muhammad fucking did this. That's what he's saying is, guys, even if you don't think this is Muhammad fucking believed it. Muhammad did this. Muhammad believed it all. And he did believe this himself as well as the prophecy of the end times genocide. He believed in the Quran and all his messengers and prophets. And he did say... This is Muhammad saying, by the way, to you, to prove that Allah's telling the truth here. Muhammad did say, We hear and we obey our Lord, and to thee is the end of all journeys. So what he's saying here, we hear, is Muhammad is saying, Yep, nice one, Allah, I've heard everything you've said, and I totally agree with everything, and I obey everything, and I'm the perfect Muslim, so technically if other Muslims don't do what I'm doing, off of the head they're dead because they're living in sin and they're not worshipping him enough that's why he's saying that then he finishes off by saying blot out our sins grant us your mercy we shall fear only you and in doing so enable us to destroy all those who refuse to worship only you Allah is the overlord of all places and things end of verse so he's literally capping off the whole of the first surah with an additional bit which is Mohammed speaking to you, the reader, through narration to tell you now in the current day, and I quote, Blot out our sins, grant us your mercies, we shall fear only you, and this is the important bit, ladies, gents, and Pikachus, to enable us to destroy all those who refuse to worship only Allah. That is the whole point in Surah 1. Worship Allah so that he can enable you, O Muslims, to destroy all who do not worship Allah. That is the point of this whole book. The whole point of this book, O Muslims, is so that Allah can woo, mind control you through putting you in poverty and punishing you if you don't give him all your money to motivate you to go out and find non-believers wherever they may be 
Jews, Christians, apostates, atheists, anyone else. Pray to Allah so you can kill them and destroy them with your religion of peace. That's what he's saying. That's what this means. And the last thing he says is Allah is the overlord of all places and things. So just in case you didn't know, no matter where you run to Muslims, you are not getting away from Allah's wrath and you must fucking do what he's telling you. You must worship him as he's telling you. You must obey all his commands. You must give him all your money, not look for thanks or praise and kill those non-believers where you find them. Otherwise, not only will Allah be pissed off at you, Muhammad will be looking for you as well. And as we know, when a jihad is put upon O Muslims by Allah, it's Muhammad that turns up to whisk their head off his shoulders and take it back to Allah. So in conclusion, ladies, gents and Pikachus, not of just this verse, but the entire first Surah Al-Baqarah, I think we can see at this point that Allah is setting up his religion. And the way he sets up his religion is by saying he is the creator of everything. And if you defy him, he will kill you. He tells lies to make sure you don't go looking elsewhere for truth. Don't ask those Jews and Christians and apostates and atheists because they're bad and we're going to have to kill them later. Then he reasons this by saying the reason we're going to kill them is because they have stolen your bounty which I gave you. All their possessions and money are actually yours. They've, th they've stolen it. They're thieves in the eyes of Allah who created that stuff as a bounty for you, O Muslims. Everything on the earth belongs to you, O Muslims, in the words of Allah in his book. But it just so happens to be in the pockets of others. So how you're going to revolve your life around getting that bounty back is by killing them and enslaving them and wiping out their culture as commanded by Allah in his call to war. And at the end of it, you have to give it all back to Allah or you'll be punished. And the final word is do all this so you can be encouraged and empowered by Allah to kill the non-believers where you find them. That is what this book means. And that's the end of this video. So hopefully you enjoyed that. You learned something. You've got um, Quran Surah 1 into your head. You know every single word of it as we've gone through so that we can have a couple of days off and then jump straight back into Surah 2 and get into the nitty gritty details of Allah's genocidal end times prophecy to kill the Jews and Christians. And we can find out how this affects Muslims and how it affects us in our lives today. So that's the end for now. Hope you enjoyed that. God bless and I will see you in the next one. Bye now. And so I'd like to take this opportunity to offer you really heartfelt thanks and a massive congratulations. Well done. We've got through an awful lot. We're going to take a few days off, do some fun videos and then crack on with Surah 2. So in the meantime, have a good night. God bless and I'll see you lovely people in the next one. Bye now.